Hi, I'm Kevin Rondino. Partners for Health Foundation is committed to educating the public about the importance of community programs that improve the health of New Jersey residents. That's why we're proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by ADP, Partners for Health Foundation, partnering to make our communities healthier, better places to live. The Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. Kessler Foundation, changing the lives of people with disabilities. And by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. And by Jaffe Communications, where business, media, and government converge in New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got this? Back. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. We are talking to a fascinating guest for the first time. Uh, she's Dr. <laughs> Janice Warner, Dean of the School of Business and Digital Media at Georgian Court University. We talk to fascinating guests all the time, but you are here for the first time. Now, as someone who's fascinated by business and leadership and has taught at a few institutions of higher learning in the area of business, I'm thinking, wait a minute, isn't it just a school of business? Where's this whole social media digital thing come in? Talk about it. Yeah, so I mean, as somebody who is pretty active in the business community, I just noticed that if you wanted to get ahead, you really had to under understand about technology and social media and digital marketing. And so our students were interested in that as well. I wanted to give them more opportunity. Um, so we started working with the graphic design department and the digital communication department, which were part of arts and sciences. I said, come on over. We can do a lot more together. We can work on getting the right technology together. We can work on programs and together. And they said, sure? They did, for sure. In, I had in, to... in higher ed, really? That yes. Well, we have a very collaborative um, team down at Georgian Court. I mean, my colleagues are just terrific. So I brought it up to the provost first after talking to some of my colleagues, and then we talked to the dean, and it just made a lot of sense. And so they came on over two years ago. Um, but before that, we started working on a, a, a minor in social media, um, and then we're, we're working on more and more things together. So, Doctor, let's do this. Let's break down. Student comes out mm -hmm. of the program. He or she has what kind of skills going out into the marketplace? Well, so we, our, our students do major in their specific thing that they, they are most interested in. So we do have, surprisingly enough, in our School of Business and Digital Media, a BFA in graphic design and multimedia. Is that right? Yes, we brought that over. But many of them will also minor in marketing or minor in the social media marketing. And so they have a little bit of both. They have their passion that they follow, followed, so they're very creative. They can create really great work, but they also know the business side and um, they're finding opportunities. Many also go on independently and they're just Start have their, their own, own professional practices. Well, do you think, is, do you sense this as a trend because you talk to other deans in the, the area of business all across the country. Is this happening in other places? It is happening in a few places. I was a little surprised because I you know, tried to be inventive myself. But when I did look around, there's a couple of schools, um, mostly smaller schools. And again, schools who are looking at ways to collaborate and give their students more opportunities. So think about this. Someone studies finance, management, you know, the traditional uh, business school courses, if you will. But they gain this social media, digital awareness. Mm -hmm. Are they? I'm fascinated by this because what I keep thinking is, what about if someone, because I, I went to you know, the School of Media at one point where I did my doctoral work, and I think, well, why would someone in the School of Media say, now I want to be part of the business program? I mean, do you recruit people in media, digital, social media into your school and vice versa? I'm, it just seems to be really attractive. People like to understand both sides. I mean, business is really important for anything you want to do. I mean, there's certain skills that will help you no matter what you want to do. So even if you can just still follow your passion but have that background, you're going to have more opportunity. And we're all about showing students that there is opportunity and that they can go out and be successful. And talk about the recruitment of faculty there. Are they 
in both areas? Are they specialists in certain areas? No, so our faculty are still specialists in their area, but they're just working very closely together. We, we you know, cut down those silos and they're, they see themselves as a team. You know, we've talked to Joe Marbach, your president, about this subject on other um, uh, caucus educational corporation uh, programs, but I'm curious about this. How much pressure do you feel as the dean of the school to help prepare the graduates of that school to, quote, get good jobs on the way out? Well, I'm not sure I would call it pressure, but I feel it's really important. I mean, our, our students are really eager to see where their future will lie. So we really try to give them that confidence and show them that there are lots of opportunities out there. You just have to be open to them. And you also mm -hmm. shouldn't just have a mindset of specifically your ideal job. You, you have to look at opportunities. Someone says, that's what I want to do. That's the only thing I want to do. What's wrong with that as a no, strategy? No, it's, it's not. I mean, you should have a passion, and certainly you should go after it, and then target companies that Where's will allow you to do that. But you want some flexibility <laughs> because you never know what opportunity may actually be come out as being something that you really love. Because what you're passionate about not ha has not only to do with what you're doing, but who you're working with and what the, the company or the organization is about. Doctor, there's a global piece to this equation. Talk yes. to us about that. Yes, we were very fortunate about four years ago to get a anonymous donation um, that allowed us to really start a global program. What does that and mean? It, and it has multiple dimensions. So um, one dimension is just staying, staying home but interacting with um, students in other countries. So we started a program where students, um, two classes, one in another country and one here, would interact and the students would work together on projects. So it wouldn't be that the class would be held simultaneously, but they'd be given a project, they'd be given a virtual team, and they'd have to get something done. So for example, we had um, uh, a school in Bhutan, one of our faculty members is from Bhutan originally, and she set up a project where the school in Bhutan was creating business plans, and our students who were taking an e-commerce class put the e-commerce aspects around it, and they worked together that way, virtually. So it not only gave them exposure to another country and business in another country, but it also um, gave them practice in working on teams and virtual teams, which is really important skill final, today. Final question, I'm curious about this. A lot of people perceive, or many people perceive, the whole idea of this whole ivory tower mentality that somehow people in academia are not connected to the real world. And you're shaking your head as I'm saying that. Go ahead. Yeah, no. Well, we especially are really concerned with trying to get full-time faculty that have had experience outside. So all our faculty have had careers outside. Um, Why is that important? Just because you can then show students how what they're learning is important, so that they're not just learning it to get a certificate or to get a degree um, or to pass an exam. Mm -hmm. They're really learning skills that are going to help them in their future. Finally, uh, talking about uh, being recognized, right, branding oneself. You were recognized by the folks over at NJ Biz as one of the top 50 women in business. You had to be nominated for that. People voted for you. What was that like? Oh, it was really wonderful. First of all, it was really wonderful because it just showed me how great my colleagues are. Not that I didn't know that already. Um, we're really collaborative down in Georgia. They nominated you. They did nominate And me. I've been to that event at NJ Biz where they have the top 50 women in business. It's a great event. It is a great event. And what was especially exciting, um, another member of my business advisory council was also nominated and received it at the same time um, from, from Hackensack Meridian. So we had a good time together. Well, you're a team player. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Janice Warner is uh, the Dean of the School of Business and <laughs> Digital Media at uh, Georgian Court University. Tell everyone where Georgian Court is based. In Lakewood, New Jersey, down in Ocean County. Great stuff. Give our best to the President Marbach. I will. Appreciate Thank it. you so much. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We now welcome Patty Sly, who is the president and chief executive officer of a, an absolutely terrific organization making a difference in the lives of so many people who need help, the Jersey Battered Women's Service. Good to see you, Patty. Thank you for having me. Describe your organization. We are a domestic violence agency that serves victims and their families who are facing domestic violence and trying to establish safety and per have permanent self-sufficiency. And how pervasive is the problem of domestic violence today in 2017 as we tape this program? One in three women in their lifetime will be a victim of abuse. And there are also men who are victims as well. And it is, when you think in terms of uh, prevalence related to breast cancer, it's twice as common.
Why? It's, it's underreported. It's misunderstood. It's um, hidden in many people's eyes. And there is an unwarranted but pervasive shame associated with coming forward and seeking services. Some of the most common, I use the term, misconceptions about domestic violence include? That it only happens to poor people, or it only happens in cities, or only certain ethnicities, or religions, or uneducated people. It is an equal opportunity problem. It's in every community. How'd you get into this? I was um, working in a hospital and was partnering with Jersey Battered Women's Service on identifying victims who were hospitalized. I became a volunteer on the finance committee at JBWS. And uh, then the executive director left, and mm. the rest is history. You know, Patty, we, we, I, I say this all the time, that we got into this so many years ago in order to provide important, valuable public information. And so in that spirit, the website is up right now. Um, but there's also a 24-hour hotline. We don't tell the location of where your offices are, but what can we tell people right now watching who either are experiencing um, domestic violence and are looking for help, or you potentially, and this is a more complicated piece on some level maybe, is if you know of someone, what do they do right now? So they can call the hotline for sure, 24 the hours. There's a trained um, counselor on the other end who can talk them through the problem, help them either address their own problem or know uh, effectively how to support somebody who they think is being victimized. There's a mnemonic device that's on our website that's called CONCERN that helps people um, speak with a potential victim in a non-judgmental and supportive way. And um, that's often very helpful as well. We're looking at some material. We're looking at the concern piece right there. Um, for those of us who have seen situations or think we hmm? either see situations or think there might be a possibility of domestic violence and don't know what to do, what do you say to us? So the best thing you can do is, is express your concern in a confidential way to the potential victim. Tell them what you've observed that um, has caused that concern. Do it in a non-judgmental way. What does that mean, non-judgmental? Um, there's a lot of victim blaming that goes on. Um, you should. Um, how could you stay? How could you stay? That Why don't help. you just leave him? That doesn't help. It doesn't at all. Why so, not? Because they, first of all, leaving um, the victim or leaving the abuser is um, one of the most dangerous times in a victim's life. Uh, because the power and control that the abuser has over the victim is threatened, which means that the abuser is going to lash out potentially even to an even greater degree. And the victims know this. So leaving is never as easy as it sounds. And then there are financial dependencies, Children family, family dependencies. Very often the abuser has um, found ways to isolate the victim from their friends and family so their supportive network may mm. not be intact as it may have once been. They may not be aware that there are services available in every county. Um, and they can access those through our website or through the national hotline. The other thing I'm curious about is for the women who come to you or in your organization to get help, what are they looking for other than immediate protection mm -hmm. and safety? Um, they're looking for affirmation. Um, they've been told over and over it's, it's, it's happening because it's their fault or it's really not happening and it's not wrong or it's not abusive. And by the um, way, if, uh, sorry for interrupting, abuse is not just the physical part of it. Can you talk about some of the other pieces or aspects of abuse? Emotional, sexual, um, financial abuse. Somebody What's may, financial abuse? Somebody may be making a very healthy income and their paycheck's going right into the abuser's checking account. They have to get an allowance for groceries. They may get an allowance for hair and clothing, but they have no control over just the basic checking account and no knowledge of the bills. So starting mm -hmm. out on your own, you have, you have no nest egg that you can access and you may not even know the fundamentals of household finance. So those are some of the skills that we teach to help somebody become self-sufficient. Where self does your funding come from? Because that's always fascinating to me. Like, who cares about this subject? A um, little less than 40% comes from a whole variety of government sources. The rest is private. It's, it's companies, it's foundations, and it's individuals. Like folks like ADP who 
uh, brought us to, to you folks. ADP has been a long-term supporter of ours, more than 20 years, both in terms of leadership through our board and financial support. You also have a program, Patty, that helps the quote-unquote abuser. I, I don't understand that. Okay. What, what does that mean? So it's a counseling program that's uh, designed after a national nationally demonstrated uh, curriculum, 26 weeks of group support and counseling services that's designed to hold the um, abuser accountable for their actions and give them a better understanding of the choices they face in their relationships. Um, it takes, clearly it takes 26 weeks for somebody to change what might be a lifelong pattern. But if, if, as they go forward, they're gonna have other relationships. So anything we can do to moderate that behavior and have them understand it, um, the, the, that's very important in terms of pre future prevention. Final question. Someone out there right now, living in fear, mm -hmm. doesn't know where to turn. You say what to them right now? You're not alone. Call a hotline. You can do it confidentially. Put it up right now, team. We'll help you. Um, or we'll connect you to the resources in your community that can help you. Um, there is a path to safety and self-sufficiency, and you deserve it. On behalf of everyone in the public television world and the partners at Fios, our digital partners. We cannot thank you and your colleagues every day for, for what you're doing and making differences and helping those who often feel there is no one there. So thank you. Your team has been doing this for a long time, I know. 40 years. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. Um, Patty Sly is the president and chief executive officer of Jersey Battered Women's Service. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by... Uh... Robert Davison, who is CEO of Mental Health Association of Essex and Morris County, and also Michelle Walsh, Program Director, Mental Health Association of Essex County's PATH program, which stands for? Projects for Assistance in Transition from Homelessness. Okay, let's talk about this. You're primarily concerned about um, people who are dealing with homelessness, right? What's the connection between homelessness and mental health issues? Talk about it. Yeah, I think we can find that most people that are suffering from homelessness, specifically chronic homelessness, which means someone's been homeless for a year or more and they have a disability, that disability is normally mental illness. So we're talking about schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, the major mental illnesses. Mm. And so it's not as much that the homelessness came first, maybe the mental illness came first and it was untreated. And, you know, through years of going through the system and maybe the system failing them, they then become homeless and then chronically homeless. How does this program help people, PATH program? It houses people. You know, it starts with going out to meet the people where they are, looking them in the eye, asking them how they're doing, building a relationship, and housing them. Just from November 30th of last year, Michelle and her team have managed to house 30 people, 30 individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, that have been homeless for more than a year. Where do you find them? Everywhere. Be specific. I think the thing I've found most since November, since the PATH program started, is that we're finding a lot of people in the township of Montclair. You know, My right? hometown, our hometown, seriously? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Where? And we're talking about people that grew up in Montclair. You know, and maybe, maybe they have a substance abuse problem and they're not talking with their family and so they lost that housing opportunity. Or maybe they have severe and persistent mental illness and their family may not understand that mental illness and be able to support them anymore. Steve, we've, we've gone out and engaged people everywhere from along the riverbanks of the Basake River in Fairfield to the riverbanks of the Basake River in Newark and everywhere in between. So it's not just an urban issue. How responsive are, again, everyone has their own situation, but you were also at Penn Station. You spent some time in Penn Station, right, mm -hmm. working uh, there. And there are a lot of folks, those of us who travel through Penn Station, we know there are people who are dealing with homelessness. By and large, how responsive are people to coming in, getting help, accepting help? Yeah, I think, especially when I went to Penn Station to work and do homeless outreach, I was very nervous that people wouldn't be receptive to me, that I looked very different than them maybe, uh, that I didn't experience the things that, that, that they were experiencing. But they were really open. The majority of people want to get help. 
They don't want to be homeless. They don't want to not have access to showers or shelter. They just, there are so many barriers, especially when you have a mental illness, to getting up from homelessness and back being housed that, you know, when they see someone that genuinely wants to work with them and genuinely, mm. you know, they can tell that I'm looking you in the eye, that I, I'm offering you a coffee and I'm sitting down and drinking it with you. Got trust. I'm, yeah. And accept it. And, you know, M Michelle's being modest. Working with individuals that are homeless as a result of mental illness is difficult. It takes a long time to build a relationship. It takes charisma and persistence. And Michelle and her staff have it, and they have it on a daily basis. But are there more men, women, what? It's nationally and in New Jersey and in Essex County, it's about 60 to 65 percent men. 60 to 65 percent men? Yes, yeah. Veterans. Any unique special issues? We're going to be doing a whole range of veterans-related programs, programs uh, actually supported in large part by the Healthcare Foundation in New Jersey, uh, organization you know well, committed to finding out what services are out there for veterans. Is there a direct correlation between veterans and homelessness? I think so. We're, we're especially seeing young veterans. Having a harder time connecting, finding their place? And connecting with people. Veterans, I would say, is the hardest population to connect. Homeless veterans are very difficult to connect because? with. They don't, they may not yet be accepting of the services. They don't want to accept that there may be a mental health issue. See, um, these, these are typically men that have had three or four tours of duty in combat. That's astounding. They just keep going back. Yeah, and, and the human brain wasn't meant to withstand that type of assault. Mm. You actually dealt with a former judge who was homeless. Yeah. So <laughs> he's, you know, I, I first found him at Penn Station. Huh. And he was abusing substances. Every day he was drinking. And the police had gone from a good relationship, a joking relationship with him, to that his substance abuse became so severe that he just became verbally abusive. Um, and so we kind of played this game where he would drink a lot, drink too much, injure himself, go to the hospital, and he would disappear for a little while. And we would try to engage while he was there. But he didn't want it. He would come back and do the same thing. And so after doing that a while, he finally kind of accepted. You know, he still has not accepted the mental health part of it. Mm. But he accepted it enough to help us get him from there. Where is and he today? So he was placed in our permanent supportive housing, and he was successfully living there. Um, but because of his substance mm. abuse, you know, this is kind of an example of how it doesn't always work out right. Yeah. Um, but now he's getting care in a nursing home. Mm. And, you know, he is, he does have a house. Bob, let me ask you this, the whole question of <clears throat> stigma. What do you think most people's attitudes uh, are about those dealing with mental health issues? And in fact, do you think it's changing in any significant way? You know, I've been in the field for 30 years, and I think the stigma is diminishing. 30 years ago, we wouldn't be doing this show. You know, your predecessor would not have done this show. Uh, however, having said that, stigma is still significant. And a lot of people still fail to seek treatment because of the stigma, because of the shame base of mental illnesses, which isn't backed up by the science. You know, mental illness, particularly schizophrenia, is biological in nature. It's a medical disorder. But the question of who cares about this, the folks at Partners for Health that we talked about before, them, other foundations who are committed to this, but there's not a huge corporate, no disrespect to the corporate community, but you don't sense a lot of corporations saying, yeah, I want to get behind mental health programming. I want to be supportive of... Where is the support for this? And government, it's all a question about what government's role is going to be in terms of dealing with those with mental health issues. Am I complicating it too much? No, I mean, part of our work is building that support. You know, if you had a family member that tragically came down with a heart issue, someone would send over a casserole. That's right. If one of your family members came down with major depression, there'd be no casserole. So we're trying to build that support and normalize mental illnesses as biological illnesses, just like hypertension, diabetes, anything else. Is it public else. awareness more than anything else? I think it's public awareness and it's comfort. What you do you mean comfort? So, you know, when it happens to you or in your family, you become more comfortable with that. This is, yeah. it, like Bob said, it normalizes yeah. it. Before I let you out of here, Tony's Kitchen Initiative, tell me something about it. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful program funded by the Partners for Health. Uh, they've been very proactive. They funded us to provide a case manager, where one of our case managers goes right to Tony's Kitchen in Montclair. That's a food great pantry. Oh, it's a great organization. Great organization. 
The staff there uh, couldn't be more proactive, and we're able to work directly with individuals with mental illness and directly with individuals that are homeless, including them referring them to Michelle's program, who has subsequently housed some of them. Mm -hmm. You bring services right to them, where they are, and right in the community. That's the most important part, yeah. What do you mean? To, to just go to the person and not expecting people to come up They're to your office. They're not coming to you. Or, yeah, They're no, not coming. definitely not. Yeah. Well, listen, um, and by the way, particularly because you're talking about my hometown in Montclair that we know very well, it just strikes me, and I'm born and raised in Newark, you're talking about Penn Station, we can't look away. We can't afford to look away. These people have given too much to our society, and you're helping them every day, and I want to thank you for being with us and helping to tell an important story. Well done. Thank you. Thank, thank you. One-on-one on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One-on-One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by ADP, Partners for Health Foundation, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision because you can make a difference and save a life.